Hi, I'm Mike Burnage. Pre-shift and on-shift mine examinations are an important part of every underground mine safety program. This training program will teach you how to perform a quality mine examination. First, you'll follow a miner as he conducts an examination in an underground mine. Afterwards, you'll practice conducting your own mine examination in a simulated virtual mine on a computer. Whether you're a new miner or a veteran miner, this training program will teach you how to conduct a proper and thorough mine examination. Thanks for watching. The purpose of an underground pre-shift is to ensure that the mine is safe for the miners to enter. What I do before entering the mine is I go over all the pre-shift exam slips for the prior shift to make sure nothing is out of service or in need of being placed out of service. I also go over any notes that have been left by the previous foreman and also glance at the mine map to make sure no changes have been made to it. The things needed for a good workplace exam are a bright light, anemometer, gas detector, notepad, and you should also carry a keep out signs and these tags to tag out any unsafe equipment. I talk to the cross shift foreman who informs me of where we've been working throughout the day and where I need to do pre shift exam. CG7, there's a little problem there. Yeah, I see that. We've got a brake problem there. Uh, I'll be sure and get that tagged out. Yeah. And, uh, looks like uh, we're working in 40 main 22 crosscut with G9, the scaler. What the pre-shift exam slips can tell me is if any equipment is in need of being tagged out of service. Upon entering the, the mine one morning, uh, uh, prior to entering the mine, I had gone through the uh, pre-shift slips and uh, of all the equipment that was operating on the last shift and found out that an operator had reported a malfunctioning brake on a, on a piece of equipment. Upon reading that on the pre-shift, that, that prompted me to go to the, that particular piece of equipment underground, uh, fill a tag out saying what the problem was, and then report it to the mechanics so that it could be repaired. That ensured that nobody could be hurt operating that machine. While driving in the mine, you may encounter some fog. Fog can cause a visibility problem, and the drivers need to be warned about that so that they can slow down. Calling outside, Rick. How about a phone check? I had been on my pre-shift one morning and walked up to the pager, one of the pagers, and uh, it wasn't functioning. OK, page me back once, please. So I proceeded to test the battery inside and found out it had a dead battery. Again, that's a simple fix, All you, you know, a trip to the supply room. Uh, it's a, just a 12-volt lantern battery, and it was easily replaced and repaired. First aid kits located throughout the mine, and it's important that every miner knows where they are located because their contents could save a life. It's important that ventilation curtains are kept tight on all four sides to prevent any leakage that might prevent CFMs from getting to the working faces. Curtains should be looked at periodically. I've gone in many mornings and found uh, what's common with our ventilation curtains is, and, you, and you'll find this in any limestone mine, where you're blasting is the, the air blast from the, from the shot itself is what causes most of the damage to your curtains. Uh, they'll tear loose from the side, the bottom. Uh, it's just like routine maintenance to go around and keep them snugged up, uh, your maintenance crew. But it's a, a, a pretty common thing in a mine where you're blasting if you have curtains. Many mornings we've gone in, uh, not long ago, uh, we went in and we found one of the main curtains tore loose on the bottom. Uh, I had a loss of uh, airflow at the faces and uh, 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 that's not, uh, that doesn't mean you have to evacuate or anything. Uh, it didn't cause a ventilation problem, so we just simply, the maintenance people repaired the, repaired the curtain when they came in. 
Berms are a requirement on all elevated roadways and to guard drop-offs. The berm must be at least as half as high as the tallest wheel turning on the property. At my mind, it happens to be 37 inches. For me, I would gauge that at about belt height. The height of the berm is not the only important thing. It should be constructed of good material. Rocks on the road can indicate a fall from the roof, and there could be more up on the roof. You should stop and examine the area, and if it's determined that it has come from the roof, you should place a keep out sign there until the area can be checked. If a miner finds rocks in the road, he should be aware that they may have come from the roof and should contact the supervisor immediately. When the supervisor arrives, the area should be examined and barreled off. After the area is barreled off, the scaler operator is called in. Once the scaler arrives, he'll scale any loose material down and then the area will be cleaned up. The area should be shut off from traffic until the problem is taken care of. Yeah, I entered the drill working area and discovered a crack on the roof, at which time I placed a, a keep out sign that I carry with me. And a report was made and a scaler operator was brought in to take care of the problem. I also look at the roof and pillars in the muck area. I look for any loose hanging rock that I can see. The roof and ribs must be scaled. No miner will be allowed to travel in by unscaled roof. Another very important thing to look for in the muck pile is evidence of a misfire. Misfires are not always easy to see but pose a danger. Any evidence of a misfired explosive device must be treated as a misfire. If a misfire is suspected, the area is immediately dangered off and the blasters are called in to investigate. Without investigating misfires, it could be deadly for people and equipment to be in the area. The licensed blaster is in charge of the blast site. However, the mine management must ensure that all regulations are followed. We're, we're currently using an MSA brand Passport, five-star Passport electronic gas detector. This device detects carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen. A couple of days I'd gone into an area where we have slow ventilation and uh, uh, was walking into the area with the light, checking their roof and ribs. And uh, the monitor is equipped with an alarm that goes off by itself. Once COs reach, CO levels reach 35 parts per million, uh, at which time uh, that's not illegal. However, by, by my standards, I would block that area and let, go ahead and let it get down to zero and what I proceeded to do. Carbon monoxide is a very toxic gas and a product of incomplete combustion. Carbon monoxide can result from all fires and explosions. Federal regulation requires that no more than 50 parts per million of carbon monoxide be present in mine air. The take action level for carbon monoxide at our mine is 35 parts per million. Nitrogen dioxide is another gas to be concerned about in a freshly shot area. Nitrogen dioxide is heavier than air and can be found in low-lying areas near the muck pile. The way it affects the body is it burns the eyes, the nose, and the respiratory tract. We must maintain at least 19.5% oxygen in all working areas. During the pre-shift, if I encounter a problem with nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, or oxygen, I block off the area and increase the ventilation to the area. Approximately two years ago, uh, I had entered the mine one morning and walked into the uh, shot area and uh, noticed a haze a yellow haze, and that's nitrogen dioxide, and uh, that's a very dangerous gas. Uh, it, it burns the uh, respiratory system and it can be fatal. The, uh, I, I was carrying our passport gas detector. Uh, it goes off at three parts per million, and uh, needless to tell you, it was a little higher than that, and uh, you need to be a little more cautious with the NO2, and uh, keep out signs were placed a little farther back to, to cordon off the area. The, the area was just left vacated until, you know, time, usually time is the issue there. It, uh, it'll, it'll take care of itself in time. A, a report was made in the uh, log book of the, ins of the occurrence. It was necessary that morning to evacuate the whole mine. It was just necessary to keep all those, keep people out of that area. The 
Mine is equipped with an emergency evacuation lighting system that I check every day. They're turned on and I drive through the mine to ensure that they're all working. During my pre-shift, I activate all strobe lights to ensure that they're working. Strobe lights are like a first aid kit. They're there, but we hope we never have to use them. Now, there was a time when I entered the mine during the pre-shift and discovered that uh, one strobe had not been functional. Uh, it turned out to be just a bulb. And uh, I was able to do the repair before letting anyone in the mine because uh, they're forbidden to go in the mine with uh, the strobes not working. We have seven activation points located throughout the mine. Uh, any one of them will activate the system. And uh, upon doing that, I discovered that uh, we had one not functional. And uh, at that point, we have uh, the bulbs on stock. It was just a simple run down to the uh, supply room to get it. And uh, the replacement was done before anybody was left in the mine.